Touching Spirit Bear, Chapter 21. Cole drove himself hard after Edwin and Garvey left, staying busy every waking minute of each day. If he had to spend a whole year in this island, he had no intention of living like an animal. Each morning, he soaked in the pond and carried the ancestor rock. Afternoons, he worked improving camp, and night, he slept like the dead. By the time Edwin visited next, Cole had built a table, a chair, and a bed frame for an old foam mattress that was part of his supplies. He made the furniture from driftwood, nails, and scraps left over from the cabin. He also started collecting armloads of firewood, cutting and splitting the wood with a small handsaw and hatchet, and stacking it in a straight pile against the cabin. Over the top, he placed strips of leftover plywood in a tarp. For a bathroom, he dug a big hole up among the trees. When the hole filled, he would cover it with dirt and dig a new one. He didn't look forward to using it in the winter. Edmund said little during his first visit. He eyed the pile of firewood and the furniture with approval. Garvey flew back to Minneapolis, he said, as he crawled into the skiff to leave. He was plenty worried about you. If you talk to him, Cole said, tell him thanks again for the knife. I'll carve something special. What? Cole shrugged. I don't know yet. Edwin started the motor, backed away from the shore, and waved goodbye. Cole watched the boat again until it blinked from sight. This time, he didn't feel the desperate loneliness and fear of four days earlier. It would not be easy, but he knew now that he could survive. Instead of returning to the cabin, he headed around the shoreline to hike and think. Wandering along the grassy flats above shoreline, a mile from camp, he came upon a huge driftwood log. The weathered white log had been worn smooth and went straight as a telephone post. It looked to be well over 20 feet long and almost 2 feet in diameter. Cole tried to imagine what kind of storm could wash such a big log up a dozen feet above the high tide mark. He remembered all too well one storm that could have done it. As he examined the huge log, an idea came to him. Back in Drake, there had been a whole field filled with totem poles. Most had carvings of animals, the same as the totem designs on the Atau. Cole didn't know what the figures meant, but he wondered if he could carve his own totem. Still, he studied the log. There was something else this log would work for. The thought frightened him, and he pushed it out of his head. He would carve a totem, but how could he move the huge piece of wood? Cole returned to camp and brought back two lengths of rope. He tied to one to each end of the log. By tugging on one at a time, he rolled the log down over the rocks until it slid into the water. When he saw how high the log floated in the water, his mind toyed with the idea that had scared him earlier. This log would make a great dugout canoe. It would make the perfect escape. With the rope, Cole pulled the floating log slowly along the shoreline back to camp, using the last two hours of daylight to push, pull, and wrestle it up over the rocks until it rested near the fire. By the time he finished, it was totally dark. Cole lit the lantern inside the cabin and made a jelly sandwich. He went to the doorway and stared out at the big log. Finally, he slammed the door and crawled into bed. For several hours, he lay awake. Even after dozing off, his sleep was troubled. When dawn finally came, he felt groggy and rolled over for more sleep. It wouldn't hurt to skip the pond just one morning. The sun was high above the horizon when he finally dragged himself from bed. Yawning lazily, he got out the cold cereal and sat down to eat, the whole while staring out at the log. If he carved a canoe, it wouldn't have to mean he planned to escape. Maybe he would use it for fishing, he told himself. But Cole knew that was a lie. He finished his dish of cold cereal and walked out to the log. He picked up the hatchet and began swinging hard, shaping a bow. By early afternoon, the end of the driftwood log had been roughly formed into a flat point. Cole felt angrier each time he rested. His only satisfaction came from swatting horseflies and mosquitoes. Never again would those little bloodsuckers feed off him like a carcass. Overhead, a pair of eagles worked the shoreline looking for fish. Suddenly, one dove toward the water. It struck the surface with its talons and rose back into the sky, carrying a large, struggling fish. Cole watched, fingering the hatchet in his hands. This was the first day he had felt angry since Edwin and Garvey left. This was also the first day he had skipped going to the pond. He spit at the wood shavings. He had just slept badly, he told himself. Again, Cole knew he was lying. He had slept poorly because he had considered making a canoe instead of a totem. Taking a deep breath, he lifted the hatchet and began striking the center of the log. Again and again, he hacked 
until a deep groove circled the log. With each blow, he felt his anger disappearing. When the log could no longer be used as a canoe, Cole pulled out the knife Garvey had given him and began whittling and shaping the deep groove into an eagle's head. As he carved, he thought about the eagles he had seen and why they were such proud and powerful hunters. He continued carving until dark. After eating supper and cleaning up, Cole went out to the fire pit and built a fire. He waited patiently until the flames burned high, then began to dance the eagle dance. Around and around the fire he circled, his arms spread like wings, banking left and right. Tonight he soared on the thermals and the air current, seeing things that only an eagle could see. After a long dance, Cole finally sat on a stump near the fire to catch his breath. His thoughts still moved high above the trees. He wished that somehow he could always stay part eagle in his mind. How could he remember to stay strong and proud, seeing everything in life differently from a distance? As Cole sat staring at the flames, it began to drizzle, and finally he got up and went inside the cabin. The dance had helped to ease the stiff pain in his hip and arm. When he fell asleep that night, he slept hard and dreamed of soaring high. The next morning, Cole awoke early and went for a soak. Afterward, as he carried the rock, he had to admit it felt good to return to the pond. He watched for the spirit bear, but saw nothing. Since returning to the island, he had caught only one fleeting glimpse. During Edwin's next visit, as they dragged the skiff up on the rocks, Cole asked, Why have I only seen the spirit bear once since coming back? I've seen plenty of tracks, but last time I was here, I saw it a bunch of times, especially after I got mauled. Edwin lifted a heavy box of supplies and headed toward the cabin. At first, it was probably the bear's curiosity, he said. Maybe after being mauled, you were invisible. What do you mean invisible? Edwin didn't answer the question. Have you finished your schoolwork, he asked. Cole nodded and handed Edwin his completed lessons. Any mail? Edwin folded the homework into his jacket pocket. There's been mail, but we're not allowing you any contact with the outside world. I can tell you this. Garvey said your mom calls him almost every day to ask how you're doing. Cole held back his emotions. I think of her, too. How's Dad? Edwin shrugged. After he was arrested, his lawyer got him released the same day. He never spent a single night in jail. Will I ever have to live with him again, Cole asked. I can't answer that question, Edwin said. How's Peter? Not well. Garvey says his bouts of depression keep getting worse. I wish I could help him somehow. Edwin turned and studied Cole. I think you're getting closer to understanding the secret of healing. Entering camp, Edwin spotted the totem Cole was carving and walked over to see it. First, he examined the tapered butt of the log, then the half-carved eagle. His voice turned hard. It looks like he tried to carve a canoe. Staring down at the ground and speaking almost in a whisper, Cole said, I started making a canoe, but I knew that was wrong, so I cut this deep groove so I couldn't try again. When I started carving the eagle, I finally slept good. Cole ended by telling about his eagle dance and what he had learned. Are you mad at me, he asked. I'm proud that you carved a totem and were honest with me, Edwin said. Cole paused. You said I wouldn't heal all the way until I discovered one thing. Can't you just tell me what that is? I don't feel like I'm healing at all. Edwin shook his head. You'll discover what it is when you're ready to understand. Then tell me this, Cole said. What are totems for? They tell ancestry, Edwin explained, and they tell stories. But how come they mostly have animals? Animals are symbols. Clinket tribes have two divisions, the ravens and the wolves. Closely related members form smaller clans. I'm from the killer whale clan. I'm not Indian, Cole said. Does that mean I can't carve a totem? Edwin chuckled. Indians don't own the trees or the right to carve. Carve anything you want. Your totem is your story, your search, and your past. Everybody has their own. That's why you carve. That's why you dance the dances. That's why you live life, to discover and create your own story. Cole listened quietly, then spoke. I haven't created much of a story yet. I tried last week to dance the dance of anger, but I felt awkward, like I was pretending. You'll dance that dance when you're ready. When will that be? You'll know, 